There's my chat. Okay. Another person wrote that time management was a challenge. All right. And I'm so we have 50 I... people so far. Where are people from? Yeah. Right, right in the chat where some people are from. Right. So why people are, are coming and getting acclimated to the chat panel and how things work. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Leslie Hammond. I work with the Home Care Alliance of New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Um, today is our second in our three-part series on uh, hospice volunteer education. Our three speaker, our three sessions today, we're going to start with Eric Bernard um, on It's Okay to Not Be Okay, Tips for the Not Okay Moments. Uh, then we'll switch into uh, Dr. Benice Burkharth. She's going to talk a little bit about um, creating a positive response for those facing memory loss. That will count towards your dementia training requirement under New Hampshire law. And the final session is a panel that uh, Lisa Chandler from Granite VNA in Concord will be uh, facilitating on filling your hospice volunteer toolbox. So if you want to keep on um, putting your responses in the chat panel, um, and then I will transition over to Eric so he can get us started as our first speaker. Take it away, Eric. Thank you. It looks like we have, pe we have people from Guilford, from Derry, from a lot of different places in New Hampshire. Anybody else from Massachusetts? I happen to be in Massachusetts. Um, some of the challenges that people are having that are, that are writing, these are great, keep them coming. My challenge is not overdoing. I've overcome nerves about playing my music in public. Thank you for playing music. Um, Laconia, my challenge is finding my niche within the organization. Um, another one of my challenges often setting expectations too high and being disappointed. I'm fine with taking risks, but cannot always take them as I like because I have considered how many actions affect my family. I've learned not to take things so personally. All Thank right, you. we have Fairhaven, Massachusetts and Fairhaven, Vermont. That's kind of fun. Yep. Oh, there's an Eric from Vermont. <laughs> um, why don't I go ahead and start? My name is um, Eric Redard. Oh, that's a big me. Um, my name's Eric Redard. I'm the director of volunteers, chaplaincy, and bereavement for Tufts Medicine Care at Home um, in Massachusetts. We serve Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, I'm also a chaplain um, that goes out into the field. That's how I started in this whole crazy business as a chaplain. Um, and I also serve um, in churches, um, congregational churches in Massachusetts and New Hampshire in a previous life. And really that is kind of where this topic came from. Um, if you happen to not be muted, ever please. There we go. Um, Really, my my previous life um, as a pastor is the one that um, kind of instigated this whole topic when we were talking about the volunteer experience. Um, my experience in the church, and and particularly leading worship, um, I led worship on a weekly basis, and I always had anxiety. Um, before every single worship service for all the years, and I've been ordained for 23 years, um, in all the years before worship, and actually even before today, um, having anxiety and realizing that it's okay to not be okay and be perfect when you walk into a situation, um, as long as you can manage the situation. 
Um, I personally knew that when um, when I was in the back of the church and the processional hymn started, there really was no turning back. It's not like I could hightail it out the back of the church because who was gonna um, who was gonna lead worship? So uh, once the processional hymn started, I said, you know what? I might as well go ahead and go for it and and go through with the service and. Of course, I lived and everything was being okay, but I learned different ways of managing that anxiety. And what I'd like to do today, um, I know there are other challenges. Um, the number one that thing that I do hear about is a lot of anxiety. So we're gonna try and focus on that. We're gonna try and focus on how we can manage some of the other challenges. Um, some of them may be boundaries, some of them may be, um, some of them may be anxiety. Um, and the other thing that um, that came to mind and I was talking to some colleagues is when we started talking about getting in front of people um, and particularly meeting someone new, um, where there's a new family, where there was a new patient, again, there's anxiety. What are things that you can, um, you can do? I instantly thought of how many of you remember the Brady Bunch um, and that episode where, um, where dad told Marsha and and Jan to uh, to just picture everyone in their underwear. So um, there are definitely different techniques of of overcoming um, overcoming our anxiety and getting through situations. So the first thing that I would like to do is we're are going to be put into breakout groups. I believe we're going to be in breakout groups of four. Is that where we? Okay. Um, and I'm going to give you eight minutes. And there are four things that um, I would like each of you to do. Well, one, I'd like everyone to, if you are possible, please have your camera on. I'm going to be pushing boundaries. Please have your camera on so that you can introduce yourself, um, where you are volunteering in hospice, um, what brought you to hospice, and what is your major challenge? Um, so there are four people, there's roughly two minutes. Two minutes goes by very quickly for each person. So introduce yourself, what hospice you work with and why with and why hospice and what's your biggest challenge. Um, and I'm gonna have people share those when they come back. So um, why don't we get sent to our okay. breakout rooms? All right, so I'm going to divide us into 14 breakout rooms. If you get to a room and there's no one else there, say return, click on return to main session, okay? So we're gonna all pop away and after eight minutes, we'll all filter back in. There's a lot of cameras off. Wait. I don't know if it's going to send us or not. I might have to assign us. It's inviting me to room seven, so I'll talk to you later. Off you go. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for seven minutes. Seven minutes starting now. It turned out to be all granite VNA in our breakout room. <laughs> That's weird. Okay. Yeah. So you want to go somewhere else? Yes, please. Okay. I, I don't know how to do that. I will figure it out. Okay. <laughs> uh, there you are. Move to. That work? Uh, thank you.
Okay, everybody, we have one minute left. Hi, Wendy and Pauline. We are waiting for everybody to come back from their breakout rooms and we will get started with the rest of the program in about a minute. The breakout rooms worked okay? I yes. see your little yes. boxes are popping back together. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it's definitely different having conferences um, virtually instead of in person, but the breakouts make them a little bit more um, personal, right? Mm -hmm. um, all right, and Eric, you're you're back and got a couple more rooms that to close out. Um, we got a, a couple of participants came in late. Hopefully they were able to share and, and figure out what was going on. <coughs> We had a few last minute people that unfortunately didn't get quite as much time. Doran, we missed your challenge. Wherever you are, could you put it in the chat? And that's what I wanted to, uh, to have people start to do. Please use the chat to put in what are things that, uh, what are challenge that you, challenges that you have and what are things that bring on those not okay moments. What are situations that you find challenging? As people put things in the chat, one of the, um, I was talking to our small group is one of the things that I hope to do in this um, presentation is solicit dialogue. Um, I'm very much a, um, yes, I would like to present some ideas, but I think with the 56 people that are here, um, there's a wealth of information within the group, um, and all of us have different experience and tools and tactics. So as I go through, please feel free um, to share experiences, to share um, your thoughts about how you overcame challenges. Um, oh, Pembroke, Mass. There we go. Norwell. Um, challenges that are being um, shared, feeling of um, wanting, overcoming the feeling of wanting to fix everything, um, keeping the messaging from the entire team consistent with the patient. That's a big one. That really is communication among the team members and not only the clinicians, but also the volunteers. That's a really good one. Challenges socializing, which is why I prefer singing to patients instead of attempting to make conversation. That's an interesting one. Is when patients don't die fast enough and end up losing hospice services. When the hospice cure, when someone graduates from hospice, um, that can be that can be very challenging. Not really comfortable with patients in non-responsive state. As volunteer coordinator, my challenging is keeping my skills fresh so that I can train volunteers effectively. That's similar to what I um, I was sharing in my group. Um, I have technically never volunteered as a hospice volunteer. I have gone through volunteer training uh, 12 years ago at Merrimack Valley Hospice, but I, I have volunteered in soup kitchens and shelters. I have always been an employee for hospice. Um, so I take my volunteer experience from working at, I worked at, I volunteered at Pine Street Inn in Boston and Shelter Incorporated and Rosie's Place and a number of different places. Um, and understanding that I am, as a chaplain, it's very different from being an employee, a, a, a volunteer. Um, 
So that maybe that's one of my challenges um, is finding enough time and opportunity for one-to-one -one connections that draw me deeper. Well, thank you for, um, for sharing a lot of those challenges. And please, again, I'm going to, um, to ask you to share, um, to share all along the way. I'm gonna kind of give you the answer, my answer um, first. Um, there's no magic to being present. There's no magic line that will work with everyone. There's no tricks um, that will work with everyone. There's no smoke and mirrors when we specifically go in. And I'm, I'm gonna focus on when we initially meet with a hospice patient and their family. Even though we want there to be smoke and mirrors, what I think we're all called to do is really to be our authentic self, to be who we were, to remember why we came into hospice, why we accepted this volunteer role over working at a soup kitchen or volunteering at a soup kitchen, because there's a lot of different things that we could volunteer our time and effort. It could be the MSPCA and be petting cats and, and, and dogs. And, and that is very worthwhile. And I do have a hospice volunteer that does both, but why hospice? Why build a relationship with a family that is journeying at the end of life? And I think we need to remember our why so that we can hopefully ground ourselves within our authentic selves and that calling to be with people. Um, I started off with anxiety and doubt and imposter syndrome and negative self-talk were things that a lot of people may, or you can raise your physical hand. See, if I raise my hand, no, oh, no, the gesture doesn't work. Um, if you raise your, your physical hand, how many of you, when you first meet a family, are anxious or feel that you're not adequate enough or there should be more information that you that you feel that you want. I may be the only one. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you for raising your hand. That feeling I realized in hospice doesn't end. We constantly meet new people. Sometimes we meet new people just once. So we meet the people come on to hospice and they eventually pass. So we're constantly meet, as a volunteer, we're meeting new families and new and no two families are the same. So how do we continue to address reintroducing ourselves or reconnecting um, and meeting hospice patients for the first time? I think sometimes we need to agree to disagree with our negative thoughts. And one of the first steps in overcoming anxiety is recognizing some of those negative thoughts that and challenging them. We tend to overthink situations and imagine the worst case scenario. Can I can imagine um, sitting outside of whether it's a patient's door at a skilled nursing facility or at a hospital or at a home where your imagination just could possibly run away with you of what's on the other side of the door, because we sometimes don't know what's on the other side of the door and what, what we're presented with. But recognizing and questioning these thoughts, you can begin to challenge them and reframe your thinking by asking yourself, what's bringing this thought up? Why am I getting anxious? What evidence do I have to support this thought? What has my volunteer manager told me and grounding ourselves in that? Is there a more realistic way to think about this situation? And one of the quotes that Brene Brown, um, hopefully some of you know who Brene Brown is, she has some wonderful books and videos, is get to the root of your negative emotions. Acknowledging that you have negative emotions, acknowledge that you have that anxiety or that turmoil. And then you have to get curious about what the trigger is. And one of the first lines of defense when it comes to these situations with anxiety is to immediately put up a wall of negative self-talk and like I will humiliate myself. What if I say, what if I say the wrong things? What are things that people feel that they're going through before they meet a patient? Thank you. 
Oh, Mary Jean, you're on mute. Because I work in the hospice house and I go from room to room, my biggest fear is walking into a room and they don't want me there. I yeah. always ask if they would like company, if I could do anything for them. And they're usually very receptive, but my fear is they're gonna say, you know, get out of here. And so, they don't, they don't, but I, I assume that they might not want me there. Fear of rejection. Anybody else? Hey, Dr. B. So, and one of the other good things is as a chaplain, I'm very comfortable with silence. So I'm encouraging everyone to please participate. Um, so the way it works is someone with, with anxiety will hear these thoughts and I encourage you to not judge them because it's not about you, but put them in the background of your mind. It becomes um, background noise while we socialize so that you can become, you can move into a more curious mindset about why those thoughts are coming up and you can, you can combat them. Um, one of the things that while I was sitting on the side of the door, or if I walk over the threshold or in a person's house, um, understanding that I had anxiety is I would definitely try and use any kind of relaxation technique. How many people have used a relaxation technique when they get anxious or fearful, um, whether it's a breathing technique or whether it is sitting and, um, and consciously feeling different parts of your body. Julie, you, you raised your hand. Um, Virginia, what, what are some things that people have done in terms of a relaxation technique to try and become more present? Should I go? Julie, go ahead. Um, a really big thing that helps me is breathing. You know, just taking the time, maybe right when I arrive in my car and breathing. Um, while I'm in the room, if the patient um, or let's say the family is um, agreeable, I will, I, I'm a Reiki practitioner. So I will, um, and believe me, as it calms the patient, it also calms me. So, um, that's helped me a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Anybody else want to say something? I oh, go ahead, Virginia. I too, of course, use breathing techniques a lot, especially just focusing on the exhale and slowing my breath and humor. So if things get um a little tense or I don't like it. Um, I use a little humor and if I get self doubts about myself, I remember this plaque I have in the room that says, blessed are those who can laugh at themselves for they shall never cease to be amused. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that gets me through tremendous obstacles. I don't need to know everything. And another comfort to me is having been a physical therapist where I used to get anxious meeting people for the fear I, I wouldn't know enough. I wouldn't know enough about them. I wouldn't assess 100% perfect. Now I'm, I don't fix. That was such a strong lesson in my training. And I remember that every day that I volunteer, I don't know much about the people. I'm just there for that that moment mm -hmm. as it is today, that present moment, that helps a lot. And I think that is, I think that's an important thing that I know I try to, to instill in volunteers. And, and I imagine the other volunteer managers and coordinators do as well. Your presence is enough. Your presence is huge. Presence is um, journeying and companioning with someone is very special. Um, and it is meaningful for those people who would like a, com a companion. Um, so just being there, you're already ahead of the game. Um, avoiding situations that trigger, 
our anxiety, not going into rooms, not not volunteering for certain things and avoiding can actually make your anxiety worse um, in the long run. We, The more we expose ourselves to situations that we fear, the more comfortable we become in navigating them. Hence, 23 years of leading worship and volunteering for some strange reason about to do um, to do a talk on uh, the not so um, the not so easy moments, you get to um, you get to overcome and and come up with tips and tactics of of exposing yourself to uh, to those situations. So deep breathing and meditation um, or progressive muscle relaxation, sitting down and and relaxing and starting with your toes and moving up to your ankles and moving up to your legs and really grounding yourself. Can I'm a very physical person, so that really calms me physically as well as emotionally. You can also set goals when you first meet someone. You want to make eye contact with a stranger, with someone that you that you um, that you first met. You don't want to be looking down on the ground or looking off into space. You want to be engaging. Um, smile, someone that you don't know. That can be practice for meeting someone new and smiling. Introduce yourself to someone new. Take the opportunity to um, to introduce whether it's at a uh, if you're at a skilled nursing facility, introduce yourself to the nurses that you may not know or the care partners that you may not know. Get to know the community. Um, give someone a compliment. Again, reaching out um, beyond yourselves and putting the focus on, on the other person. Um, one of the other things that I suggest is starting small. Um, Volunteers can get into different situations, and we do ask you to visit hospitals. This past weekend, we had a vigil at one of the local hospitals, and I asked. We ended up having five different people cover a twenty-four hour period um, in a vigil, and sometimes it's not very easy to go into a hospital, um, a hospital room. You go into patients' homes, hospice, um, working in hospice houses. You may walk through many un you walk through many unknown doors. If new situations make you anxious, it's important to start small. Begin by practicing with small interactions with people so that you feel comfortable around them. Maybe if you are an administrative volunteer because you don't like going out to meet with patients, you can start talking with the clinicians in the office. Um, and meeting them and maybe even shadowing them out into the field um, to get to know patients and get to know the different environments. And you can gradually increase your exposure to, um, to the different situations that you, that you find that you possibly could really be benefiting a uh, patient and family. And also celebrate the small successes and gradually work your way up to more dynamic situations. I have volunteers that that do um, that's I volunteer that started off just making ad admit packets because they really they they wanted to volunteer for hospice but didn't know what they wanted to do, weren't sure about meeting with patients, so started off making admit packets and then they graduated to doing um, check-in calls, calling patients and families on a Thursday morning and building a relationship with them. Eventually, they wanted to meet with patients, so we moved them over to the High Point House, and they were able to work in the kitchen, and then they went and took orders from, um, from patients in patients' rooms. So there was a gradual progression of integrating um, of integrating a volunteer to meet a patient. You didn't have to immediately go and, and visit patients. There was a, an easy um, back, an easy way of progression. Um, challenging yourself, understanding where you do have your boundaries and limits. You, it's it's healthy to kind of challenge them. I mentioned that I volunteered at Pine Street Inn. Pine Street Inn is a huge um, converted building in Boston 
that houses several hundred um, homeless men and women. Um, it can be a little daunting for people to walk in there. Um, I did volunteer with a group of people. We would go in, we would stay in the kitchen, and we would um, prepare meals for four or 500 people. Um, and I found myself staying in the kitchen um, during the first couple of, um, of visits, making sure that there was the serving, uh, the serving tables in between me and everyone else that, uh, that was there. But the more I went, the more I really wanted to learn about people's stories. So I ended up venturing out into the dining area and talked with a couple of people. And I would say that the next visit, I don't think I went back into the kitchen. Um, I was always out in the dining hall and they would have to call me back into the kitchen to, to go and, and, um, and help prepare food. And they'd be like, oh, you have enough people. Um, how many of you have had that kind of experience where you slowly made the transition from maybe a behind the scenes, um, behind the scenes volunteer opportunity to kind of being with patients or on the front lines? Does anyone have a story or an experience of that? Feel free to unmute yourself if you like. Virginia. Well, my role is um, uh, harp. I play harp at bedside. And I, the first few years, I got a growing feeling that I was always hiding behind my harp, kind of like hiding in the kitchen. And that my interaction was that way. But now I call myself a companion who happens to offer music. And I get to know the people and that leads me to the music. And so much more delight because it engages people. Big, big difference. That's awesome. That's awesome. And now that your harp is a companion rather than uh, something that you hide behind. Yep, that's awesome. There's lots of opportunities to to do um, to do different things, and every volunteer activity that you do is valuable. One, it, we need people to, to companion and sit bedside. We need people to help with admit packets. We need people to, to talk on the phone. Each of those tasks are have different gifts. Um, I know people that we have people that have been doing check-in calls or tuck-in calls for years, and they have built relationships, phoning families constantly week after week after week they get to know the patients sometimes more or, and families sometimes maybe more than someone who visits them once a month um, because of the nature of the call because of the nature of the situation but every volunteer position is valuable and needed and I'm not insinuating that you need to move from admin to direct care it's just if if you're using your anxiety or if your anxiety or if your negative self-talk or if something is inhibiting you from progressing into something else that's really what we're trying to um trying to deal with one of the things that i am a huge advocate for is self-care it's essential for everyone but especially for people that are anxious um, and need to overcome or manage that anxiety Remembering to be kind to yourself and know your limits is really important and not to push yourself to a breaking point. I think all of us have, whether we're anxious or not, all of us have our limits and boundaries that we need to address. Um, one of them can be, I mean, proper time management. I have volunteers that want to volunteer for more than four hours or five hours a week. And I'm like, I really think that based on on uh, based on what they're doing, I really want them to to hold off and take care of themselves and not be too um, not be overly involved. Um, making sure that people get the basics, getting enough sleep, eating well, engaging in regular exercise, whether if that's on the peloton um, 
or if it's going out and walking in the woods or um, doing a puzzle, something that recharges you. What are some things that you guys do for self-care? This is a softball, everyone. <laughs> Where do you I did just give people instructions on how to share. You can use the so, raise your hand tool. Oh. Raise your hand. Um, oh. <laughs> I am, I'm on off mute, right? You heard my microwave. Um, Liz Cooper, I have seek the dog. I've been trying to do more self-care. I have started the past few months getting back to swimming laps at the Y and um and I do try to get out on walks and my husband's big on little hikes with the dog as much as the dog can do um and I'm trying to get back into knitting because <laughs> so I can do that while I'm doing greeting at the hospice <laughs> house and end up with a Christmas present for someone hopefully <laughs> thank you Elizabeth anyway so I'll get back off um, um I can figure out how. <laughs> I see Janet and then Bobby. Janet, you're on, there you go. Okay, and then I'll have to make sure I figure out how to get rid of my hand up. I so, can help you. <laughs> um, I like to do a couple different things because I get bored um, doing the same activity. Um, so it's either hanging out with my dog, walking with friends, um, getting a book from the library, um, and uh, right now it's eating Halloween candy. Um, but, um, but I try to do something that um, keeps me grounded with, with the reality of like, you know, when you're on the airplane and they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself to be able to take care of others. So I have to remind myself to hold on, take a break, give myself some uh, times to breathe and then I can go back to volunteering and not feel drained. So. That's awesome. That's Thank you for sharing, Janet. You're Bobby. welcome. Now, Bobby? Unmute, Bobby. Yes, I was just being asked for permission to record. I guess I that wasn't said to me before. Um, my biggest, one of my big challenges is that there's too much going on now for me. I volunteer in four different arenas. And, um, and that, you know, I also, I, I also get um, rounded by listening to music and um, training my dog or, or playing with him um, and nature, my garden plants, but um, I, I do have to do more self care and, and, you know, go to those doctor appointments I've been missing and whatever. So it, it's hard for me um, to say no to groups and and that's been challenging to juggle it all, juggle it all. So um, I, I do do deep breathing. I feel that when I'm anxious or just too stressed, I breathe very in a shallow way. And so I need to, you know, restore myself by taking a couple of deep breaths and that tends to relax me and go into the parasympathetic um, it, uh, area which is much better thank you thank you for sharing i, I saw one more and i'll let it go back to eric on how many more he'd like but i think Ginny, did you raise your physical hand Ginny hool rider oh you have to unmute Ginny. you um click the microphone button yeah there you hi go. Yeah, I I uh, did raise my hand, but I also used the chat. You know, for me, uh, my husband and I are avid fishermen, and so we are always making time to go fishing every week. And so my vo volunteering for hospice um, works itself within that period of time, and all this nature and good fresh air and all of that keeps me grounded. Thank you. Thank you, Ginny. And there's some wonderful, thank you for putting um, more in the chat. I love that the nature walks, painting, discovering painting in your retirement and fishing. I haven't, can't tell you how many years it's been since I've been fishing. 
uh, yoga, forest walks, spending time with friends. I think spending time with friends is is important and community can be very regenerative and and being with people that you may that you can just be yourself with. Um, I think that's that's really important. Um, as we get to um, to the end of my time, I don't want to take too much of Dr. Burkhardt's time. Um, anxiety and doubt can be challenging. And whenever you meet a new person, you're meeting new people all the time. Finding ways of managing um, how to introduce yourself, managing whether it's anxiety or, or self-doubt. Um, hopefully we've been able to talk about techniques for doing that. Um, recognizing negative thoughts, practicing relaxation techniques, starting small and challenging yourself in healthy ways, um, focusing on the other person, um, the practicing self-care can build your confidence so that you can hopefully be okay in those not okay moments and with those not okay feelings. So I thank everyone for, um, for participating. Um, it was it was a great discussion and thank you for participating. Um, I now get the honor of introducing um, for our next section, Dr. Bernice Burkhart, who um, I have the privilege of being a colleague with. She serves as the Chief Medical Officer at Tufts Medicine Care at Home. She's been engaged in the practice of hospice and palliative care since 2005 and has served as a volunteer for the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, serving on the regulatory, regulatory Committee and Palliative Care Advisory Council and a physician and advanced practice provider um, for my NHPCO community. She is a certified hospice medical director and serves on the board of the Hospice Medical Director Certification Board. Um, Personally, she is a wonderful educator and very knowledgeable, and I'm very excited um, to listen to, um, to your presentation, Dr. Burkhardt. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Um, and I will uh, start with, um, I may need help, uh, Leslie. So I will um, share my screen. So far, okay. so good. And I was hoping to try and put it into, um, you know. Presentation yeah. mode? Yeah. Uh, so let me try that and see if, did that change for you all? Yep. Are you seeing just, okay, perfect. Okay. That's great. That really works. Okay. So um, thank you. Uh, Eric, when Eric and I first spoke about this, I was very excited. Um, because I was speaking to volunteers. And so uh, you are participating and giving in this feedback cycle of goodness. Uh, so this is a real, it's a happy talk um, with a little bit of nerdiness uh, thrown in. Uh, and in the description, and Eric and I talked about that as well, certainly, we talked about, you know, when you are caregiving, uh, for someone who is facing memory loss, either early in the process when they are highly aware of it and uh, troubled by it and the implications of it, uh, and looking towards a very frightening uh, future, uh, to when many of the changes have taken place and when we see them on hospice care, right, um, a little later, I think sometimes people forget that the individual who is sitting before you um, is a full human being uh, because what we see is someone who is not them the selves that they were uh, in their in their prime and uh, we tend to look at them as ill individuals rather than as individuals who have this disease process going on and I'm saying that not volunteers, everybody in healthcare uh, does that because we're so rushed to try and get to the next step for that individual and how can we help them uh, get better or stabilize 
um, that sometimes that takes the priority. So I, I just want to remind us all um, that kindness counts and it uh, gives back in so many ways. So, okay. And here is my problem. I, oh, problem. I can't have Yes. I yes. got it. All right. See, this is just so great so far. Um, so, uh, and I will use some words interchangeably. I, I Kindness, choosing to do something that helps others, right? I will probably include compassion uh, in this as well. Uh, and um, most of us come to a place to volunteer our time, our energy, our services, if we do Reiki, uh, right, um, or play the harp. Uh, we do that because we're motivated by feelings of wanting to give back and to share the goodness that we have in our lives uh, with others and to bring that sense to others. And, you know, the science behind it shows that it has a very positive effect on the giver, uh, right? It, it perpetuates giving and showing kindness by reducing the stress response in the individual giving it in uh, increased activity in the reward centers, again, from giving kindness. And, you know, by adding to our social connection and bonding, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But many of these uh, areas of the brain are uh, part of the neural system called the limbic system, which is the system that uh, functions to process, regulate emotion and memory uh, while also dealing with learning, right? Um, so behavior, motivation, long-term memory, and our sense of smell, which is also tied to memories, um, relate to that limbic system and its fear of influence. And I, and I share this with you, uh, there will be a test. No, I share this with you um, because I want you to, to understand the power behind our actions. There are physiologic chemical changes that happen and they are bound within our physical brain. So uh, kindness, something that believe it or not has to be reminded to professionals like myself going through training through medical school is Kindness is part of the patient experience. And I know it seems intuitive. Uh, and, you know, now as a mature adult, I look, look at it and go, well, of course it is. But again, as a, as a person who is coming up in training, and I say this so that you can help the young doctors you meet as you volunteer that you will be exposed to and know that they need to grow in that arena as well. And to understand that their job is not just to order the right medication, the right time, that is important, by the way, very important, but they must do so in this context of kindness, right? So um, the research doesn't just support the giving of kindness be having a positive effect, but it also supports the fact that patients who receive compassionate, kind, patient-centered care, they're more satisfied. And if they're earlier in the process, more willing to comply with their medical treatment, right? So you are actually, when you have acts of kindness and interactions with patients and you contribute to that sense of belonging, right? That sense of wellness and of spirit, uh, you are contributing to their ability to actually work with the system and comply with medication programs. And I know we don't use that word comply, adhere to the medication programs that are recommended for them to lead to a more positive outcome overall. And ultimately you cannot provide really good care, whether as a professional caregiver or as a volunteer caregiver. And you can't put the patient at the center if you're not coming from that place of kindness. All right. Here's something that I found incredibly interesting. Uh, people who actually do the kindness underestimate the power of the gift that they give in their kindness. I'm gonna say it one more time. People do it, they perform their acts of kindness and yet they systematically, it's, it's, it's clinically significant, it's relevant that they undervalue their positive impact on the recipient. Why does this matter? 
because it's a feedback loop. And if you're not feeling like you're actually making a meaningful difference in someone's life, you're not going to be compelled to keep doing it in that loop. So I say this to remind you that every act of kindness and kindness is presence. You don't have to give anything. You give of yourself, right? So the kindness of presence, of respect, of dignity that you provide to individuals, particularly those who are facing this horrible challenge of right of, and disease of memory loss, it, it makes a huge difference in their lives and in their days. And it does linger with them after the act is gone. So it's a positive and a lasting impact. Uh, that you will often underestimate. And I, I will share with you, um, if, if you don't mind, one interaction I had. And um, I, I love the work that I do. I do. Um, sometimes I'm doing three or four things at the same time. And I get called in to, and I see nods of agree. Yeah, we all do that. What's a big deal, right? But, um, and I get called in to speak to a patient family member or a patient themselves who is challenged with adhering to an agreed upon plan for their well being and safety. And as a human being, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, I have so much to do. I can't possibly get, you know, sit and be present because that's what's needed. But um, Eric mentioned this technique, like, or someone else may have, but I thought it was Eric, when, before you walk into a room, you collect yourself. And um, I think it was last year or the year before that we had a guest speaker um, at the annual conference who talked about feeling, uh, trying to imagine that she was walking through like a rain shower, you know, before you walk into the room, um, like a waterfall car, um, curtain. Um, so that she could clean whatever was occupying her mind beforehand and and be open to what was going to happen as she walked in the room. So I do practice that uh, technique because um, I find that it, it helps for me to focus and, and focus on what I'm about to undertake. And uh, it was one of those situations. And I did the waterfall shower before I walked through the room. Before I walked in, all my phones were on vibrate and in my pocket so that they weren't out and a distraction. And we started talking. And as we started talking, I became so acutely aware of the fact that really they just needed to hear someone say this one more time in a different way. Uh, and I, I started to rethink how I was doing things, that I wasn't going in for work, that I was doing this, that I was, I was giving of my time, I was doing an act of kindness and being respectful and present. Uh, and still I underestimated the value of that interaction, right? So I did the interaction, closed out the family meeting. They indicated that they had understood what I was saying, um, that we had reached a place of agreement. And I left thinking, all right, check, you know, on my list, I, I gave of myself, I did this, I was present and I, and I completed that task at hand. And it was later after the patient had died that there was a, you know, the family sometimes send letters and they talked about this one interaction um, and how much it meant. And I had no idea that it was that big of an impact on them. It allowed them to move forward in the process and um, move forward to a very beautiful death experience for, for all engaged and involved. So uh, I, I, I give you this example to share with you that you may walk away thinking, yeah, what did I do today? You know, I sat there and I read for somebody. Ugh. It really does matter. It makes a huge difference in what you do and it does have an impact and it impacts you. Just try not to undervalue what you do. All right, so the studies, right? Uh, Kelly Harding, Dr. Kelly Harding wrote a book called The Rabbit Effect. And um, they talked about uh, kindness and compassion and caregiving. Uh, both uh, volunteer and professional. And uh, what they did was they took a bunch of rabbits and um, fed them a high fat diet. Uh, and they found that those rabbits who received that high fat diet that were talked to, picked up, picked up, cuddled, actually had less heart disease uh, because of the impact of that intervention because they had a control group that did not have that additional intervention that had the higher level of um, artery blocking deposits in their blood vessels. So we have 
proof that physiologically changes do happen, right? And then uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University did research in which more than 400 healthy volunteers were exposed to a cold virus. I don't know how they could do this, but they did. Um, and those who received the daily hug were 32% less likely to get sick. So uh, just to give you some, there's actual data behind it uh, and studies from respected institutions. Again, I'm not sure how they exposed people to a cold virus and got that by the IRB, but um, maybe it was before real standards. <laughs> So other benefits of kindness and compassion. And again, I can't reiterate enough that this is a cycle. It improves happiness and it promotes and contributes to good mental health. It actually builds your immune system as evidenced by, right, the report that we saw with the cold and the hug. Uh, it reduces anxiety, stress, and depression. And I know, Eric, you were just talking about anxiety, right? It improves relationships because it... Um, adds to bonding, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and it contributes to longer life. Uh, so um, kindness does count, it matters, uh, and uh, in dealing with individuals who are uh, troubled by illnesses, particularly those in which they lose themselves um, in the present, uh, it is uh, critically important to uh, imbue kindness and compassion in your interactions, which again, I'm speaking to a group of people who volunteer, right? So you already have a head start. All right, lots of words, just, um, but to speak to the chemistry and there's another uh, chemistry note, but when we experience kindness, dopamine is released. Dopamine is a very happy, happy uh, neurotransmitter, right? Um, and so it's actually referred to as helper's high, but it also has that same impact on the receiver. Many of you have heard, heard of the, the love hormone, oxytocin, right? It's um, for uh, milk letdown as well. So it encourages us to love our babies um, and it promotes that feeling of love and warmth. Um, but it also is present in um, kindness interactions and gentle touch. Right. Uh, and then, of course, oxytocin itself releases a chemical called nitric oxide, which expands the blood vessels, reduces blood pressure, protects the heart. Again, not just feel good stuff, but physiologic body changes that are impacted. Right. Remember when I said it can help you live longer? Well, <laughs> oxytocin can also reduce levels of um, free radicals and, and inflammation. Again, not just in our cardiovascular system but importantly there, because that helps to slow down the aging process. And, you know, when I talked about bonding, we like people who show us kindness, right? Um, and that's because kindness actually contributes to a sense of feeling more bonded. And as part of our evolutionary progression, in order to survive, cooperation with one another was critical. And it's those emotional bonds within groups that enhanced our chances of survival. So, it's built in. It is built in in us. We have kindness in us as part of, you know, who we are as a as a species, um, and that's evolved over time because it's been protective, right? Uh, and there's a ripple effect. When you're kind to others, they are kinder to others, and not just the people who receive it. People who witness acts of kindness are kinder to others as a result of having witnessed acts of kindness. So you're impacting not just the individual you're um, interacting with, but others around you as well. And um, I will share uh, with you, I don't know, Margaret Mead, uh, people know who Margaret, Margaret Mead is, um, anthropologist. And she um, used to, her students would ask her what the mark of society, civil society, right? What, what a true mark of society was. I'm sure many of you have heard the story. And, and what she said was, when we find um, like a fossil or a remains of, uh, of a human being or an animal, but a human being with a broken bone that has survived. And, and she pointed out that meant that this was a society that cared for all of the individuals in it because with a broken bone, someone had to get you food. Someone had to help you move about. Someone had to take care of you if there was a threat. 
And so that was her marker for society. And again, our evolution has primed us um, to imbue kindness in our acts. All right, that positive feedback loop, it's pretty simple. Um, you give or receive kindness, you feel positive, that adds to your happiness, has all those side effects we talked about, right, with the helper's high and the life prolongation and decreased inflam inflammatory uh, cytokines and factors to give us an enhanced immune response. Uh, and, it, and it feeds your pleasure and reward centers, so it motivates you to continue to do that. Now, rep repetition counts. Um, so the more acts of kindness we do, the more we're impelled and compelled to do them, uh, and the greater the positive feedback on ourselves and on the others with whom we interact. So, uh, and I have to move things around in my slide so I can see what's going on here. But uh, as I mentioned, it's not just a one-way impact. It impacts you as the giver of kindness, it impacts you as the witness of kindness, and it impacts you as the recipient of kindness. And some other, again, chemical interactions that back up these feelings um, are that when you make the effort to feel compassion for others, when you treat them with patience and kindness, it actually reduces stress hormone level of cortisol in your body. And as many of you may know, too much cortisol can actually impair memory and it interfere with your brain function. And it's a stress response, so it also aggravates other factors as well. So again, this sense of kindness feeds itself and promotes well-being uh, is, is critical. And then a word on the power of touch, <clears throat> because you, you, you always have to be so careful, right? Um, you can't just impose yourself on someone. You have to you have to be able to take the temperature of what's going on about and around you. Um, but generally, safe and gentle touch um, actually again has a positive physiological impact on the individual receiving that touch. It calms cardiovascular stress. It activates um, the body's vagus nerve. Uh, and having a positive impact as well. And again, with oxytocin, there's a release with that gentle, right, touch. Um, and that's why, again, oxytocin is referred to as the love hormone, um, whereas dopamine is the happy hormone, uh, along with our neurotransmitter, along with serotonin, which is also released. And that is here. So physiologically, kindness can contribute to positive changes in the brain, again, making actual changes by increasing levels of serotonin and dopamine, both neurotransmitters, which produce feelings of satisfaction and well-being. And that causes your pleasure and reward centers in your brain to engage. And so that's very positive. Another impact, endorphins are released, your body's natural painkiller. So when you show kindness, you also help treat your own pain. It also has a similar impact on recipients. So we see that people who are treated with dignity, kindness, compassion, and respect tend to do better on their pain scores and may have lower requirements of opioids if that's part of their care plan. And again, you know, I think most of us are kind individuals, right? That's why we, we, we're, we're attracted to the work and to the uh, volunteers and volunteering that we do. Um, but I think it's intuitive and we need to be sometimes a little more intentional, right? In making sure that when we approach people, we do so from a place, again, that is one of kindness and dignity and respect. And I'll actually go over that a little bit in a minute. So again, remember I said I was gonna use compassion and kindness almost interchangeably. I know that the definitions are, are a little different. Uh, however, um, if you'll allow me this, we know that when we provide compassionate care, it makes patients more comfortable. Again, remembering that it helps physiologically with their pain. It helps them when they're feeling ill and it helps when they're suffering from mental or emotional distress. Distress, distress. not that I'm having any. Uh, and uh, it is essential 
that compassion is part of the care for it to be, as I mentioned earlier, right, truly patient-centered. We talk a lot about patient-centered care and caregiving, both from a professional and from a volunteer standpoint. And uh, sometimes we think that means that everything we talk about is the patient. But it's, it, it means exactly what it says. You put that patient at the center. You're looking at them. You're interacting with them. You know, even if what they contribute is to that overall conversation, if their family members around is perhaps not as um, voluminous, because I'm, I'm being very careful and not to say not as valuable because it's as valuable as anybody else's interaction. It's just a little different sometimes, right? So, and then again, this is um, from a uh, nursing uh, instructional manual in which, you know, they, again, you don't think you need to teach people this, but again, because there are so many lights flashing and alerts going off and, you know, the patient across the hall is looking like they're going to be on the floor soon. We have to remind ourselves that showing empathy and compassion are a critical part of professional and volunteer caregiving. How can that be uh, demonstrated? Positive gestures, nonverbal cues, open body language, right? Listening, making eye contact. I, uh, in preparation for this, was looking through some quotes from individuals early in the process, in the disease process of Alzheimer's disease, um, when they were able to um, communicate in a more full fashion. And they, to a person, uh, indicated that having someone look at them when they talked to them was critically important to them. It made them feel seen. It made them feel that the individual was engaging with them and it made them feel better. And that feeling better stayed with them after that interaction. It gave them almost a boost in self-esteem and confidence as well because they felt that they were important and they mattered, right? And um, so I love top tens. I don't know if uh, I'm aging myself. There was a late night show where they did a lot of top 10 lists <laughs> um, in the 70s, but it lasted throughout like the 2000s. So, you know, but anyway, 10 tips for communicating for, some, for a person with dementia. And I want you to kind of tie in um, where the kindness fits in with this because it, it very clearly does. That initial being in a positive place, setting the stage, right, is a positive mood for interaction. Making sure that you have that person's attention if they can give it and giving your attention to that individual as well is again, as I mentioned earlier, when I described the people who had early Alzheimer's and were able to share their feelings. The important thing is to be clear and direct. Um, and so you wanna state your message clearly. You wanna ask simple answerable questions. Sometimes you may have to go to the yes, no question, right? And not leave something wide open because that's overwhelming sometimes for people who are having either word finding difficulty or who have not, who are not able to give you an answer for what happened five minutes ago, right? But, and we'll get to that a little bit later in this list. Remember when I talked about engaging with the nonverbal cues, it's to listen with your ears, of course, but your eyes as well. And of course, having an open heart, right? While you're listening to be able to take it all in and be in the moment with that individual. If there are activities that you are participating in with the individual, you wanna break it down into a series of steps and you don't wanna give all the steps at once, right? Um, because again, it's like if you sit down to a table and there's overwhelming feast of food on it, you almost, you almost can't eat because it's overwhelming. It's the same thing with providing multi-step instructions. It's so overwhelming, you just almost don't even want to try. So again, we want to frame things in the most positive setting, in the most um, reasonable setting for success, um, and in doing so, and in giving, again, very clear, 
simple direct instructions will get you from point A to point B. Why go through all this trouble when you can just do it yourself to help them, right? Because individuals, as part of giving them compassion and kindness, it's respecting their dignity as a human being. And there are things that they can still do, even though you may want to step in and do for them, right? So it's a question of, again, taking the time, simple steps, um, and having the patience um, for it to take a longer time than you would expect. And then when the going gets tough, which it can sometimes, uh, you want to gently and kindly distract and redirect, right? Um, if they were having a nice time talking about the flowers in the cabin, what they went to in the summers when they were teenagers, and somehow you get to this other place where they're now stressed out, you can stop, distract, redirect. Tell me more about the flowers, right? and get them into a place that they're comfortable sharing with you. Again, you wanna respond with affection, but really with reassurance, because um, depending on what stage they are in their illness trajectory, particularly for those who have memory loss and, and cognitive impairment, sometimes there's an awareness of that loss, depending again on where you are in their illness, where they are in their illness trajectory, and sometimes there's a sense of confusion. Am I answering the right question? So you want to affirm and reassure during your interaction. So that, and that is an act of kindness. I'm just going to label it for you because you may not acknowledge it as such. You may think that's just me being a human being. It is an act of kindness and it has a highly positive impact on the individual you're interacting with. And then when this says, remember the good old days, that goes back to a lot of these individuals have memories from 45 years ago, but not from 45 minutes ago. And if they're good memories from 45 years ago, then that's where you want to go with them to have them share with you. Many times it's how they see themselves, right? Or how they saw themselves at their best or who they think they are or have been. And so you want to affirm that you want to reassure them that that person is still in there by listening, by accepting, and, and um, again, by framing it in a positive setting and context, good body language, open. I think, Eric, you were the one who talked about the smile, right? I, I have a trick, again, because I'm often burdened with many things at one time. Uh, before I answer the phone, I stop and I physically smile. And it changes the tone of that conversation from whatever it was going to be to a much more pleasant experience for both people on the phone. Um, so again, putting yourself in that positive place before you interact can be helpful. Um, and if you need to pause and redirect and put yourself back in a positive place, um, you know, it can be very helpful just to stop for a second and physically it's hard. You can't, the act of smiling itself uh, just puts you in this headspace that is a much more positive place. And then finally, I think someone else talked about their humor, um, maintain a sense of humor. Humor, again, makes you smile, makes you laugh, um, adds that positive context and, and puts you in a really good headspace to be able to um, work with and interact with someone who may need a little support in getting to a good headspace, right? And oh, I love this quote, um, but it was particularly true um, in looking through, again, you know, how kindness and interaction with uh, folks who are facing a cognitive impairment, worsening memory loss, dementia, is we must infuse our care with them to go beyond the task-oriented work, right? Go beyond cutting the cubes so that their finger size, so that the individual can feed themselves to sitting with them and smiling and reminiscing like how they loved that their mom made them this special cracker treat or something when they were younger. That That's, it's beyond just the task. Um, and just a reminder to keep doing what you have been doing as volunteers, just even 
taking on that charge, we know that you are compassionate, kind individuals. Um, and just a reminder that it is a part of your caregiving that you give to patients um, and not to get overwhelmed with tasks. But I'm gonna close. Uh, I'll open for questions and discussion and sharing how you have impacted other people or how you felt impacted by kindness because I do wanna explore that with this group. There's one thing I didn't get a slide for and I just wanna be very clear. Probably the most important person to show kindness to is yourself. So I, I just want to let that sit there with you for a minute because we forget, right? Especially as volunteers, you're outward facing, you're giving facing, that's what you're doing. And you forget that you need to direct some of that kindness inward to yourself as well. Um, and show yourself patience and show yourself compassion and show yourself dignity because that will feed into that loop and then you'll be better able to serve as well. So with that, I will stop the science show here um, and open for questions, comments, and thoughts about how you have seen um, acts of kindness, uh, the impact on, on folks. And I see, um, yes, it was the David Letterman show. Oh, stop aging me. Um, <laughs> so Tanya, I don't know, this is... Um, Thank you for putting this out. Did you want to share that with us? I'm I'm a big believer in hearing things too. So I'm looking for you in the thing, but I can't find it. So, as, as you were speaking, it just reminded me of this story. Uh, Kathy Hopkins is both a hospice nurse and runs a, a day away program for people with dementia in our community. And I remembered her talking about this around holidays. They would have an activity where volunteers and the participants with dementia would collectively create these food baskets for families who were food insecure. And so they made it very manageable. The person would pick up a ticket with a food item. They would walk across the room to exchange the ticket for the item. They would bring it back and put it in the basket. So, um, and then each time it would sort of bring up this conversation with their volunteer about why are we doing this? And each time the volunteer got to talk about um, this act of kindness, this act of service, the people who will benefit from these baskets that they're putting together. And so it had all of those side effects that you were talking about. And I love that as an example where not only is the volunteer obviously getting all that goodness, but they created an opportunity where the patient or the client could feel uh, empowered to that act of kindness too. And so it was reciprocal. And I, I just love that as an example. And I think even though that was a group environment, there's a possibility to translate that to our individual interactions with people who have dementia. Absolutely. And that is a key point um, that it can also, depending on what stage people are at, can positively impact that, dement that patient who suffers from dementia by giving them that positive feedback, right, of giving. Um, so yes, yes. Jeanette. Oh, you're still on mute, Jeanette. Hi. So um, my grandmother got dementia and through a long series of weird stuff, I was her caretaker. And I did that for eight years, not in my home because I was single and had to work and she could no longer be alone at all. She'd get confused and frightened. Um, anyway, long story short, that eight years that I spent with my grandmother, I know was the best thing I've ever done in my life. And it has given me some kind of a sense of wholeness ever since she's long past now the darling and uh i i can remember clearly all of our wonderful interactions in her dementia it <laughs> we had a lot of humor she'd repeat and repeat and repeat and then i'd say remy i i don't think i can answer that again she'd go okay and We'd like turn a page in a magazine and look at that or something, but 
I, I don't know. It's just wonderful. It was wonderful. And that act of kindness, I don't know why I was capable. I don't know why I was able, but I was. And uh, it's rounded out my life in a way ever since. It, it stayed with me. I just wanted to share that. No, I'm muted. And thank you for sharing. Um, there was a question to me is, so even if the person with dementia doesn't necessarily remember the hug, the conversation or the visit, do they still have the positive? Yes, they do. They do. Um, so uh, they still have the positive effects and the positive brain chemical effects. Um, so again, don't underestimate the power of your interaction. Do you have any other questions? Or yes, uh, Bobby. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. So thank you very much. Actually, both of them have been. Um, but I want to mention that I took care of my dad. He had dementia and it gradually got worse. He was violent. Um, mm -hmm. I had said to him in the beginning, I'll never put you in a nursing home. And towards the end, I changed it to, I will always take care of you. And mm -hmm. I put him in a, a, an Alzheimer's unit where he um, actually found another wife and um, was so happy because they were meeting his needs, although he had resisted so much. And I had thought, you know, he would never go into a facility. He actually loved it in the end. Um, and there was another story I was going to say about him, but... Um, I can't remember what it was, so uh, maybe I'm getting dementia too, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, sharing. Thank you. And I, I think, you know, what you said was so important. Um, if you guys ever have interactions with other people who are also taking care of their loved ones, your critical transition from I will never put you here or there to I will always take care of you um, is so beautiful and meaningful. And I thank you for that lesson because there it, it's hard for us not to immediately make a promise from a good place that um, sometimes is not able to be followed through for the patient's safety, for the individual safety, for your safety, for whatever reason, uh, and framing it, reframing, which is something that you know we learned to do quite a bit, but reframing it to, I will always be with you, I will always help care for you, um, keeps you true to your word, and is a, is a promise that you can keep, no matter where that patient or individual is, is. So I think that's a beautiful thing that if we could share that for others, um, would help them in their journey as well. And your hand is up. So did you have more to add to? You remember the other thing? Oh. I just remember what it was. When I took him to a doctor, um, he was dying of also of uh, cancer. And um, the doctor ignored him. And he talked to me only. And he said basically in, in high language about my dad's you know, pulmonary ability and, and everything else. And, you know, basically saying he wasn't going to live long. He walked out of the room and my father, who didn't say much, turned to me and said, I've always tried to be a good father. And it meant to me that he understood on some level what, what the message was. Um, the other thing is that he became, he didn't talk to me a lot toward the very end and I sat with him anyway. And then um, there was a storm. I came in quickly with a, a um, boom box. I said, Dad, I can't stay here tonight with you. I'm going to leave this music playing. And he turned to me and said, I won't be here tomorrow. And I called my husband. I said, you know, Dad hasn't said much at all. But he just said this, and I'm staying with him. So... Sometimes we don't know how much they are really getting because they can't always express, but um, we shouldn't give up. And thank you. Again, thank you for sharing that. Very important. And, and it's an example of what I said. It sounds like it's intuitive stuff here, but clearly, you know, professional caregiving professionals, physicians um, need to remember that there is a human being in front of them 
regardless of how much they are able to meaningfully connect or that they think they can meaningfully connect because of the cognitive impairments, uh, that we must still treat that individual who is a human being with kindness, with dignity, with respect and compassion, um, which means addressing them, right? Um, as part of the group who you're talking to and the primary individual who's impacted um, initially. So certainly um, that's a sad example of how the doctor did not um, go to my medical school where we're taught that, <laughs> but uh it, it's something that um, we all need to, especially, in, again, in the professional caregiving realm, we need to pay special attention to and remind ourselves uh, on a daily basis. Yes, yeah, soul to soul. That's right. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barkara. I think we are now in a time of break and then we have a panel. Do we wanna take a break? Why don't we take a um, three minute break and come back in just a couple of minutes and Lisa can uh, introduce our panelists and we can continue with the conference. Sounds good. Great. Now's the time to refill your coffee. <laughs> I could put you all in a two minute breakouts. Right. See you later, Eric. Thank you. And thank you, Leslie. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, actually, Bernice, since you're still here. Yeah. I'm um, still here. Okay. Can I have the slides to share with everyone? I'll forward it to you. Oh, yeah, to awesome. so, yep. yeah. Thank you. All right. You bet. I'll talk Thank to you later. Um, Leslie, mm -hmm. I, I suppose we could we could talk about it. Yeah, this is Catherine. Oh, okay. I just can't see if your screen's on. Okay. I have to find the right buttons. I'm I'm figuring it out. Hold on. All right, I'm gonna message you. Okay. All right, so one minute.
Oh, I should have played some music. I have some Taylor Swift right here. When Eric gets back, we can, can regroup. Did everybody stretch? One of our, right? Um, one of our first virtual conferences was our fall conference. And we had um, like elastic stretch bands to send to everybody. And everybody could do a yoga and stretching exercise at that time. We still have a bunch of them in the office. They're like sort of like bungee cords. I, I have younger kids. I, they were just something to snap at each other. It wasn't a good, it wasn't a good scene. Leslie, do you just you want me to kind of jump in and welcome everybody back? I think that'll work. Yeah, let's uh, let's okay. talk about the panel. So I will before we get started on our panel. So yeah, we're gonna um, head into the last section of our second session. Um, during this panel, I'm going to send everyone, or I'm going to put in the chat the link to evaluate the program. Um, only under a third of people who participated last week evaluated the program. I want to tell you that the six of us that put the program on, we devour that feedback. Like we really do want it. So if you attended last week, I'll put that link in as well. And I'll, I'll put in the evaluation for this week. Um, we really do take that uh, real seriously. Last week, it was noted that uh, we really needed a, a break between um, the speakers. So this week, you have a break between the speakers. Uh, last week, it was you know, maybe we could have focused on more on, on the hospice volunteers specifically, and this week we're doing that. So if you can give us feedback, we really do appreciate that. Um, and so yeah, evaluate the program. I'll send the links. The recording and the handouts will also be on the website um, and in an email that I'll send to you at the end. Okay. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Lisa. And if you're on the panel, go ahead and unmute yourself, but everybody else should probably stay muted, including me. Go ahead, Lisa. Uh, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, it was a great morning so far for me. I've been um, writing down notes galore. Um, so thank you um, to everyone uh, this morning for the those presentations. Um, my name is Lisa Challender, and I'm the volunteer coordinator at Granite VNA. I've been the I've been the volunteer coordinator there uh, for about seven years now, and I have a partner up in our northern. Um, office, Randy McDonald, who is also on this call. Um, one of the things that we were talking about when um, we were planning this conference, and, and I've talked about many times in my volunteer trainings that I do, is um, kind of developing a uh, volunteer toolbox. And the volunteer toolbox uh, is some act our actual things. But as I've been thinking about some things this morning, it can also be some tools that um, in the way we speak, in the way we act and things like that. So um, I hope we can cover all of those areas today. Um, I'm very happy to have um, three of three um, panelists today. So I'm just going to basically um, kind of briefly introduce them. And then I'm going to ask that each of them sort of rotate through the questions that we have. And then at the end, we'll definitely take questions from the chat if we have time. So uh, be lo I'll be looking at the chat to see, uh, you know, what questions there are so that make sure that we can answer those for you. Um, so today we have, again, three panelists. We have um, Paige Chaplin, who is a music therapist with Tufts Medi <clears throat> Medicine Care at Home. We have Donna Raycraft, who is a um, hospice and bereavement volunteer here at Granite VNA. And we have Philip Huckins, who is um, an end of life doula hospice volunteer. Um, and I'll let him tell you much more about himself. Um, so, first, um, Paige, would you like to introduce yourself and just kind of share how you got into this field and what, what kind of work um, are you doing with uh, hospice patients um, today? Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Paige. I'm the uh, board certified music therapist. Oh, I just got spotlighted. Hello. Um, <laughs> I work at Tufts Medicine Care at Home. Um, I've been the music therapist here for about uh, four months, I think. Um, 
And prior to this job, I was in grad school for counseling and music therapy. And I actually did my final internship um, with Granite VNA. So Lisa, it's so nice to see you. Um, so small world of hospice. Um, and I currently, uh, my current role, um, I work um, in patient homes and I go to um, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities. And I also work one day a week at our hospice house in Haverhill. So I work with um, patients who are very close to end of life um, and who are actively dying. So I do kind of a wide range of, of things. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Philip, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, just share a little bit about what you do with the hospice patients and families and how you got involved in this? I'm Philip Huckins. Uh, I live out here in Keene. Um, my motivation largely for being involved with hospice, uh, my mother was treated like the Queen of Spain at the residential hospice facility in Concord. And I've always wanted to um, repay that tremendous debt. Um, I keep failing to win the lottery. Uh, I'm retired and have uh, an abundance of time. And so I wanted to um, I wanted to say thank you for taking care of my mom by uh, heading into nursing homes as frequently as I can uh, here in Keene to to be present, to be someone who reduces the anxiety that that comes with being in a nursing home. Um, I was a teacher for almost forty years, uh, so I was a, I got paid to talk, and now I'm a volunteer who who's learning to listen. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, and we also have Donna Raycraft. So uh, Donna, if you don't mind, if you introduce yourself and just share a little bit about what you do and how you got involved in this work as a volunteer. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've been a volunteer with Granite VNA for um, going on 11 years. And um, I, I chose to do this in order to be successful at retirement because I thought I was going to be at a loss of things to do. I found out that's not true, but I'm uh, glad that I didn't know that so that I found hospice. And I think um, the reason I did choose hospice was um, the most a defining moment in my life was when my mother died and I was um, a young adult and it was before hospice really came to the United States. And I, when hospice did get here and when I learned about it and when it became known, um, my my wish was that she had had that when she died and the dying experience would have been um, very different. So what I do is um, with, the, with the help of Lisa is uh, patient companionship and uh, caregiver respite and um, I facilitate bereavement groups and I do Reiki with patients and sometimes with their family members. And um, I think, I can't tell you which, which one of those I enjoy the most, but I know that it gives me much more than I give to them. And so that, that last, um, the actual scientific reason that we receive more than what we give is um, just, is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the first question I have um, for the panel is, you know, we talked about the theme of this year's series is expanding your comfort zone. Um, that's where the magic happens. So I'd like the panelists, if you wouldn't mind, to share a time in your experience working with patients and families where you took a risk to step out of your comfort zone that resulted in a memorable encounter. And then also um, a memorable encounter, an aha moment, and then maybe what you were feeling before and after uh, that happened. So um, Paige, I'll start with you. Yes, um, so just a few weeks ago, I was at the hospice house in Haverhill and I um, was there visiting a patient who I'd been working with for a, a 
about two months prior. So I'd been going to her home and she had a few respite stays at the hospice house as well. So this was, um, this was the time when she was actively dying. And so that was tough. And so I was sitting in the room with her and her son, her sister, and um, another volunteer um, with uh, Tufts. And I sat and I played a few songs at bedside that I knew that she enjoyed throughout our time together. And then I remembered that her son was also a musician. And so I thought, what if I gave him the guitar and let him play for his mom? And my thought process was kind of like, well, I know that this patient has historically enjoyed music with me, but this is really her last, you know, it, it ended up being her last day alive. And I thought, I think, she would really love to hear her son play and sing for her. And so I gave him the guitar and he sat and he's, he was like, hi mom. And then he played a few songs for her and it was so stunning and, and, and remarkable. And it created a connection not only between him and his mom, because when people are actively dying, a lot of people assume that they are like completely unaware of what's happening I believe that people who are actively dying can hear what's going on in the room. Um, hearing is one of the last senses to go. So he played songs for her and sung, and it was so stunning. And it also created this connection between him and his aunt, who kind of had a little bit of a rocky relationship. And I was asked after this patient passed away, I was asked to participate in her memorial service. And I went there and I saw her son and he gave me a big hug. And he said, I want to thank you for that moment that you, you know, facilitated. And I was like, well, I want to thank you for having the, the openness and the vulnerability to share that and to, to give that to your mother you know, before she died. And so I think with, with music therapy, I, I'd never heard of a music therapist give, you know, giving over control, I guess, um, control. That's an interesting word in the work, but that was kind of a moment where I was like, this could be interesting, but it was really also just, this is her son and this is going to be really special. And so it ended up being really special. And it was a moment that I'll never forget ever. So, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, I had the pleasure uh, of going to a, a live seminar with Tipa Snow uh, a couple weeks ago. And, um, you know, some of the things she talked about was how do we provide effective support and, and specifically around um, dementia patients. But um, some of the things that Paige talked about are like right off the list that I wrote down um, to be in the moment, uh, to go with the flow and to be willing to try something new, um, and also to be willing to see it through another eye, another's eyes. So you were thinking about the sun, you were very empathetic and compassionate. So thank you for sharing that story. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Philip, would you like to go next? Of course. Um, I was seeing uh, an elderly gentleman who was near dying. Unfortunately, the facility in which he was housed was riddled with COVID. And so I avoided going in for, for my own health and the health of my family. Excuse me. <clears throat> my volunteer coordinator called me and she said, uh, your companion is actively dying. And if you want to see him, if you want to spend time with him, now is the time to go. So I took all the precautions I could and I walked into his room and he immediately sat up and exploded into tears mm -hmm. because he thought that he'd been abandoned by me. Um, this was a person who had some family issues as well, but he he, he burst into tears uh, and he, he, he's just so pleased to see me. Um, and what, what the lasting lesson for that is for me, 
and I was on I was unaware, I was just blissfully unaware, is how deeply connected our hospice companions uh, are to us. We are, we know that we are connected to them, but I had no idea the depth of the connection that that particular companion felt for me. Um, it was, it was, I'm getting a little choky now. It was a, it was an incredibly moving moment. Um, he, and it, it brought him so much calm, so much ease, and you could just feel the anxiety leaving him. Uh, and he was able to die a peaceful and good death just a few days later. Uh, we often hear, we often hear that the, that the dying wait, are waiting for a resolution of something or a long lost companion to appear. I'd never been the long lost companion, and and I and I was, and um, it was it was quite a gripping moment for me. And um, it's just a reminder of how deeply felt our visits are to the people we do visit even though we might not know it at the time. Uh, it was a tremendously moving moment. Thank you, thank you. And I think um, as the hospice volunteers, um, and Philip described it very well, is we actually do step outside of our comfort zone when we agree to visit patients and to become part of their lives because we're putting our self out there, we're vulnerable, we um, are, sharing a piece of ourself with someone else. And that takes courage because um, if you're opening yourself up, you know what the end is going to be, right? Our patient is going to die, but in, you do this work in, in spite of that. So I would say that a lot of us, many of us, all of us do step out of our comfort zone just by doing this work. So thank you. Um, Donna. Thanks for saying that, Lisa. Um, my, I hadn't had a lot of uh, places where I felt too uncomfortable um, in the 10 years plus that I've been doing this until recently, because um, I thought I was creating healthy boundaries by choosing to see only female patients and not reaching out to men patients. I thought that would be, um, I could do a better job. And re very recently, um, I had a chance to companion and do some respite work with a um, a man, and it was um, very enjoyable. I really liked being in his presence, and he died. And then even more recently, I've started companioning with a 91-year-old man who has the beginnings of dementia, and I have fallen in love with him. I come home and tell my husband that there's another man in my life. Um, I just absolutely adore him, and he gives me so much pleasure in a couple of hours that I listen to him tell stories of his life, and every single week, they're the same stories, and every single week, he enjoys telling them to me, and I so enjoy listening to them, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad that I had to sort of be pushed out of my comfort zone and um, and able to do this with Wonderful. this gender as well. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I know sometimes as volunteers, we kind of think that we have a particular type of uh, patient that you know we would be the most comfortable working with. And so I always love to hear um, when volunteers sort of take it on themselves even just to try something new. So um, thanks, Donna. Um, so one of the next questions that we have is, um, what are some of the first things you do um, when you're introduced to a patient or a client to establish connection? Um, Eric was mentioning that that sometimes can be sort of anxiety producing for us. Um, so I, I would like you just to share what are some of the first things that you do um, when you uh, meet a patient for the first time, uh, Paige? Yeah, so I think for me, I really try to be um, soft and easily approachable. I don't go in there and, you know, singing and saying, let's play, let's sing, let's <laughs> have a guitar, like, let's do everything. Because I feel like that's, uh, you know, a little bit intense. <laughs> um, 
And I'm not out here to make people feel uncomfortable. I think there's a lot of preconceived notions about music therapy. And so I feel like part of my job is to, um, is to kind of put people at ease that it's not about, you have to sing with me or you have to do this. Um, and sometimes people have a lot of questions about music therapy. Other times they do not. So I think it's, it's gauging where that conversation needs to go about this is my role. This is why I'm here. Um, I think I, I always prioritize um, learning about people's musical interests and musical histories. What's your relationship with music? Did you ever play an instrument? Do you play an instrument? Were you in a choir? Did you play organ at your church? Um, so I try to get that, you know, as a, as a framework for the building of the work that we do after that, um, ongoing. And, um, I try to take note of any family dynamics I'm noticing, um, because there's a lot of space there to create connection, especially, um, between spouses. Um, I try to always learn what their first dance song was at their wedding. <laughs> I try to, Oh, I love that. Obsessed with that. Um, <laughs> So I try to just gather little nuggets of information while always staying true to developing a relationship the normal human way, which is just, you know, who are you? Who, like, what do you love? Who do you love? Um, you know, if I'm at the hospice house, I try to ask people if it's a daughter visiting her dad, I'm like, what do you love about your dad? And usually it makes people cry and it's beautiful. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I try to do. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Philip, how about you? Uh, <clears throat> first thing, first thing it's important to realize, oh, excuse me, it was important for me to realize is that nursing homes are incredibly chaotic places. Um, and when you first go in, you, you, I shouldn't say you, when I first went in, it was very difficult for me to see that there was a pattern. There was a, there was, a, there was something going on other than chaos. And so if I were advising someone who was a new volunteer, I would say, when you go in, the first thing to do is as, as was mentioned earlier in the day, focus yourself, get yourself as calm as possible. What it, uh, if you can, don't bring in your phone. For me personally, when I go in, I when I get dressed to go to do a hospice visit, I try to look as little like a medical professional as I possibly can intentionally. Because there is a most of the experience I have, there are no single rooms in a nursing home. So there is an LNA, there is a medical assistant, there's a nurse, there's perhaps a physician, there's the building engineer, there's the respiratory therapist. They're coming in and coming out. And they're all there for a specific and necessary purpose. So I try to go in and not be a multiplier of that anxiety. I move slowly, I talk slowly, I I try not to face the person directly when I'm talking or when I'm standing or when I'm sitting. I try to be at a less confrontational, in a less confrontational posture. I, I, as I said before, I made my living as a teacher for 40 years and I had a lot to say in a very little time. Now I have very little to say and a lot of time to say it. So I just... I just move slowly. I, I move so slowly. And when I walk into the building, I have an erect posture. I look at everybody I can. <clears throat> I say, good morning. I say, thank you. I try to be a person who brings that additional positive emotional energy to the building. Um, when I leave, Sometimes I, I always try to leave. I'm going to show you something that I, a little gift that I try to give uh, a caregiver if it's the right moment. I saw this phrase. I hope you can read it. Can you all read that? Mm -hmm. It says, yes, the world is a better place with you. 
I give these to nurses assistants and nurses and the engineer and they look at it and they're like, what the hell is this? Oh my God, that's really <laughs> beautiful. Thank you very much. So it's just this little thing. And sometimes when my uh, companion is asleep, I'll just put my name and the time I came in on the back of that. It's my primary mission is to <clears throat> A, not add to the anxiety and B, to take away as much of the anxiety, as much of the stress of, of, of being a dying hospice patient. I mean, ugh. so, but then as people have mentioned, it's really incredibly important for me to purge that when I leave. So I have about mm -hmm. 7 million miles on my bicycle this year. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I think um, what you were talking about reminds me of what Eric was saying about, you know, just remembering your why and trusting your desire to do this work and being yourself and really just kind of showing up and sort of being open to what will happen and being observant because all of those things you described for volunteers that go into, yes. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, but one of the things I learned in uh, doula training was the acronym, acronym, uh, WAIT. Why am I talking? Mm -hmm. So I go to open my mouth and I say, they're not done talking. Just be quiet. It's not, you're not there for you. You're there for them. So mm -hmm. wait, why am I right. talking? I use it all right. the time. Yes. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, Donna, what, what, what would you answer? That? How would you answer that question? Well, after... Um initially meeting somebody and I want to start a conversation. I want to develop a relationship with someone. Um, I always look around the room and um, see pictures. People always want to talk about the people they love or stories about their life. So I will say, tell me about, tell me about this picture, or sometimes it's not a picture. Sometimes it's um, just something else in their room or in their home. And I might say, tell me about this jug that is right here. And there will be a whole story about it. And there'll be whole stories about their relationships with people. And I remember it was quite a while ago, I was visiting a woman in um, an assisted living situation. And um, I just felt like we weren't making a connection or that she wasn't uh, connecting to me and I wasn't connecting to her. We started talking about pictures. And then what we did for the rest of her life was every time I came, she would get out a different picture album and we would go through it. And it would be a different time in her life, a different time in her family's life. And she would tell me stories that went with every single pictures. And that's what we did for all of our visit. So I think um, helping people to make their connections with their loved ones, and which gives me information about them, which can um, help me to um, uh, in my next visit with them. And I think um, what Philip said about moving slowly is so profound because sometimes we go in there and we're just so excited. We want to meet somebody. We want to give them information. We want to hear all their stories or whatever. And they're at a time in their life when they're not running anymore. Um, they're um, thinking, moving slowly. And you, I have to remind myself to just get down to their pace. So thanks for reminding me of that, Philip. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Um, the next question that we have is um, just what are some of the challenges, which of course you may have already talked about some of those um, in your um, answer so far, but are there any other challenges that you face in the work that you do and how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, Paige? Yeah, so I think um, some challenges to the work um, that I do specifically. Um, and I knew this would be a part of my, my work as a music therapist because music therapy as a profession is still, um, it's not a, a super new profession actually, but to a lot of people it is, you know, what do you mean you're a music therapist? Like you could just get a guitarist to come in and, and play and it would be the same thing. 
And so part of my work is to advocate for the profession and the the benefit of the profession and the worth of having a music therapist. And, um, and I think sometimes people, um, people have either preconceived notions or misconceptions about what it is and what it can look like. And so that's also part of my rapport building is, is navigating that conversation of like, well, why are you here? You know, I, I played music as a kid or whatever, but you know, what does that have to do with right now? And so that's like connecting those pieces. Um, so yeah, advocacy is a big piece. It's a challenge, but it's also something I love to do because I love to help people understand why I do the work I do and why I love it. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's also good. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot of challenges are like that. I think that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's Thank you very much. Um, Philip. Uh, there are many challenges. Um, the first is if, if you don't have experience with the, in, with the hospice environment, the general population thinks that it's the place where we put our loved ones for them to die. They don't understand it's a place for them to be celebrated and to be given the opportunity to live as fully as possible for however long that is to, to help them have a good death. Um, it's a, and it's a very difficult thing to explain what hospice is. It's an equally difficult thing to explain, why would you ever want to spend time with the dying? The, the day-to-day -day challenge that I face when I'm visiting largely is, um, is family, family of the dying companion. I have in my mind how I would behave or did behave when my parents were ill. And um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult when um, families can't, difficult for me, when families can't say, okay, yes, there was this thing that happened then, but dad's dying now. So let's move beyond that. I was, I'm stunned by, the only way I can phrase it, I'm stunned by the rudeness, the lack of civility in 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 uh family and that that's that's really difficult for me mm -hmm. and the last challenge um well not the last challenge but the last challenge for this is not being overwhelmed by by the simple sadness and and the overwhelming nature of what you're doing um when i first started i had two companions one was easier on my system than the other so i I, I made sure that I saw the more difficult, the patient with the more difficult life first, and then the, the 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 easier life second. And then the first few weeks when I was a volunteer, I would just come home and sit in my chair. Bad idea. Get moving, write a letter, go for a walk, get out, do jumping jack, stand in your head. Do not, do not sit at home and just stew in the experience um it'll consume you mm -hmm. and so i'm 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 much i'm much better at that now it's very difficult right. I have to say yeah. everybody i mean congratulations for everybody who does this I, I signed on around 10 30 and i haven't heard anybody say what i'm about to say it's very difficult work it's it's tremendously it's tremendously satisfying but it is tremendously exhausting work um, so that's part of the challenge for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as someone who acts, you know, who works in hospice as well on a daily basis, um, you know, that's something we talk about a lot in our supervisions is, you know, how do we kind of, um, keep this work in a place where it doesn't ov overcome us, you know, and, um, I just want to put a plug in for vol volunteer coordinators in this, um, uh, moment, because that is part of our job, um, uh, is to help you, process any feelings that you might have and help you through this time. So if you ever feel like you want to um, talk about it or you need some additional support, that's what we're, one of our jobs. And I'm sure I, it's, for most people, I would say is true is it's one of our favorite parts of the job is because we want to support the volunteers who do all the hard work. So thanks, Philip. Thank you. Um, Donna. Well, I, what I was going to say is the, um, the ultimate challenge is that the person that you've come to really care about is going to die. 
And that's the ultimate challenge. There are smaller mm -hmm. challenges that come up like um, um, I had, I was doing respite for um, a patient um, who didn't want me there. She didn't think that it was necessary that she be babysat. And so I just, she liked to watch television. She watched television the whole time I was there. And I just sort of sat in a chair in back of her and we watched me TV. And every once in a while she would uh, mute it and ask me a question uh, and then go back to her television. And as weeks passed, there were more mutes and um, uh, more questions and more conversation. Um, but the ultimate challenge is that you have to keep in your mind that this is not a long-term relationship. Um, the person that you care about is going to die. Uh, and that's okay because that's what we're here for. And we know what grief is and grief is a normal part of um, something ending. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the, another question is, so I know in a lot in the training that I do is I talk about um, volunteers kind of having a tool bag that they can bring, like a literal bag of sorts that they can bring with them, either keep it in their car or um, take it in the rooms with, when you go. Because as we know, when you're with a patient, it's never, it can never, it can, it cannot always be what you expect. So if you have a few little things to try, then you know you have some 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 um, tools to be able to do that in your bag. So Paige, um, obviously your guitar is one of your tools that you use. Is are there any other like tools, physical tools that you use when you um, when you go to visit patients? Yes, um, lots of tools, lots of fun tools. Uh <laughs> So I have a really great Bluetooth speaker that I would totally recommend everyone get just for themselves. Um, it's super portable. Um, it's, it's great for if I don't know a song and can't play it, I can play it on the speaker. Um, it gets very loud. So if there's anyone with who has um, hearing impairments, it's great for that. It's it, it's not just amplification, really. It's also just the quality is really good with like enunciation. And it's really good for people who are hard of hearing um, so they can experience music too. Um, and I also have an arsenal of instruments. I have, you know, little drums. I have shakers. Um, I'm assisting right now with a bereavement group um, for kids that we meet at the hospice house every other week. And they just love to play the instruments. If they see the instruments, they immediately want to grab them um, and just bang away at the drums. And we had like a little drum circle last week and it was just so fun. So like, those are my, that's in my toolkit, still figuring out a way to carry everything around and not <laughs> be dropping everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's my toolkit. <laughs> Oh, wonderful! Thank you very much. I like the speaker. Do you can you do you mind sharing the um what type, what brand that is? Yes, I I can actually put a link in the chat. Um, okay. Yeah. Great, great. And I one thing that stuck out to me is um you know one of the challenges as a volunteer can be working with patients and that are hard of hearing. Um. So I. I never really thought about that before, um, having one of those things available in your tool bag. So thank you for sharing that. That's great. Yeah, there's there's also this other little thing that I have that you can also get on Amazon. It's super cheap. It's like battery operated. It's like a little tiny amplifier that you can clip to your pants or your shirt or whatever. And then it has like kind of a Britney Spears style <laughs> wearable <laughs> um, mic that you put around your ear. And it's it just amplifies your voice just a little bit. You can make it go kind of loud, but it, it helps with, with people who are hard of hearing. So oh, great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Good luck. Um, I don't have, I, 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 I'm sorry. I don't have this part of my homework done. No, I'm kidding. I, mm -hmm. I don't have a tool bag in terms of what to bring. I was so excited when I was first, um, training to be a hospice volunteer because I it would I thought it would give me an excuse to play bridge uh, but but the the companions I've had 
they actually so play chess, play checkers. They haven't had with distal neuropathy. Can't, they can't pick up the pieces. And also with um, oxygen deprivation, they don't have the focus or the attention. So my tool bag, the, the, the inscription in my tool bag is we're human beings, not human doings. So I'm, I'm just, it's present, particularly uh, when people are at the very end of life and they're, and they're asleep or they're just, I go and I read to them and I'm, I'm going to give you a series of titles of books that I, I find great comfort in reading to them because I, 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 even if they can't hear the words, there's a tone and there's a, there's a connection through. So this is one of my favorites to bless the space between us. Mm -hmm. If you don't know that, um, this is an incredibly uh, powerful book about end of life, final gifts. Um, anything by Thomas Merton. This particular book is Thoughts in Solitude. Ah, it's so gripping. Um, two more. This is a wonderful series of daily prayer. If you have um, companions who have a spiritual life, a religious life, by Flannery O'Connor, who was an incredible short story writer. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the works of Rumi. Um, these are the four, I guess that's actually five. Those are the five books that I choose from uh, when I'm seeing a, 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 a companion who's near, very near the end of life. Um, with one of my former companions, because his family was so far away, I, I went every day and I would read. I would read from them and it was as soothing to him, I hope, as it was to me. Oh, oh that's wonderful. So when you said you didn't have a, a, a tool bag, I was thinking, oh, well, your tool is yourself, obviously, and you have your little cards, but then you have these wonderful books um, as well. And I know a lot of probably hospice volunteers have maybe read Final Gifts. Um, so if you haven't, um, you know, it's a, definitely worth, it's a quick, easy read. And because you're interested in um, hospice work, uh, I feel just about all right, I think. Uh, so, uh, Donna. Um, I, have, I don't have so much um, a bag as different things that I bring to different people. Um, one of the things that I do for, um, well, this is sort of like uh, Philip, but on a uh, much uh, lower level. Um, if I am with a person who has dementia and who is elderly, I have a few vintage children's storybooks that I bring in and um, they really enjoy them. And if if they can't read them, then I read them to them. If they read them, we can stop and talk about, either way, we can stop and talk about, for instance, there's one that talks about um, a boy and a girl who are walking to school. So we might talk about what school was like when they were younger. One time I brought one in and it was the first, I hadn't brought it in before. And the um, VNA, um, caretaker was just leaving and I was explaining to the person that I had this book and um, I had intended to read it to her um, but the caretaker said oh she she can't read she can't see and she, those words had no longer come out of her mouth that the patient started reading the book and um, we read that book quite a few times and had quite a few stories um, another thing that I like to have handy is hand lotion so that I can give people um, hand massages. And that's something I've learned from um, another volunteer. And um, when you're giving a hand massage, you're also getting a hand massage. And oftentimes people will fall asleep while you're giving them the hand massage. And uh, it's very calming. Um, I also have a Bluetooth speaker um, that I use mostly with um, elderly people. And um, the same woman who really liked the, the children's story also liked um, music of her day. And my daughter was looking at my phone one day at my playlist and she said, mom, why do you have Lawrence Welk on your playlist? Um, so expanded my repertoire of music. Um, and what I take now with the patient that I 
told you about that I'm in love with um, is dog treats. Um, and when uh, he has an elderly dog, a little tiny elderly dog with one tooth, and um, I come and the dog knows what I have in my pocket. And the two of us together get to uh, watch this dog enjoying her treats. Um, so um, whenever there's a dog, it makes me happy. And I also can bring something for the dog. And when somebody has a pet that they love a lot, if you do something for the pet, you're doing something for them as well. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm taking a look at the time and we're kind of getting to the point and I knew that we would have just some wonderful conversations with our panelists. So thank you so much for that, um, Donna and Philip and Paige. Um, and there's so much uh, to talk about in this area for sure. Um, the one thing I wanted to share that I want to have in my toolbox that I'm working on is not even actually physical tools. Um, it's things like um, having um, different phrases to sort of open conversations and to continue conversations. Like, you know, tell me more about that. Tell me about that. Um, being in the moment we talked about, going with their flow, what the patient wants. Be willing to try something new. We've talked about that. <clears throat> Be willing to see it through another's eyes. Um, and this one is good for our anxiety as well, is be willing to fail and try again. Um, that's kind of how you, uh, number one, you learn things. And number two, you may experience some really, that's where you might experience some of that magic. Um, trying to be a detective, not a judge. Um, and when I make visual contact, I want to look interested and friendly, um, sound enthusiastic. And like um, Philip was saying, not really sort of getting in their face, but kind of going alongside them. Um, and also there's some positive action starters that I learned from um, Tipa Snow um, to get people to do, it, especially dementia patients, um, you know, ask them for help. You know, you're so good at this. Would you please help me? Um, and then if you're, if you're having some difficulty, you get it, you know, sort of working with someone and they're like resistant to maybe something you might want to do, you could say, can we just try this? You know, let's just try it. Um, and then as, um, our speaker talked about keeping, um, our, our sort of step, our requests or our conversations, one piece of information at a time and step by step. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of tools uh, that other volunteers use. I suggest that you maybe check in with your fellow volunteers to see some of their tricks and tips. And maybe this is a topic for us to cover a little bit more in detail, or even the volunteer coordinators can kind of develop some training around that. So thank you for that. So it's my job to wrap things up for today. I hope that you have all um, enjoyed this time together. I love seeing all of the people on the call. Um, I was asked a question um, about end-of-life doulas. Um, I know, Philip, you're probably better to talk about it than this, but I will say that, you know, it's a special training that people receive to be able to accompany uh, people on their end-of-life journey. Uh, a lot of times they are volunteers within our hospices, but also they also volunteer. They also have their time in the community. Sometimes um, they do that as their paying job. Um, they've been trained in all different types of end of life um, issues. Some of the stuff that hospice volunteers are trained in, but maybe perhaps in a deeper level. So I said, you know, I encourage you to check that out online um, if you would like to know some more. Um, so next week is our last session. So I hope you will um, join us for that. Uh, and also, as Leslie said, um, to please fill out the um, feedback form that um, that will be emailed to you. It is important as a member of the committee that helps to plan this event. We do definitely take that in, uh, into uh, consideration when we meet and talk about, you know, how can we make things better? How can we engage more people? So. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for being here. And um, I hope you have a really awesome day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Lisa. Thank you. I will include links to all of the books that um, 
Philip and others have mentioned in my uh, email to you this afternoon. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, Marino. He goes to High Point House at 4 a.m. on Tuesdays to do Reiki every Tuesday. All right. All right, it took me a minute to clean it up. I had to like move people out. So Catherine, uh, this is Eric, who was a speaker earlier. Um, and then Tanya, oh wait, <laughs> hold up. Same thing. Uh, I don't need to stick around. I was just checking in with folks. <laughs> No, nice job today.